everyone. I'd like to welcome you here tonight. Thank you for all coming. And uh, uh, apologies for the, the uh, small amount of space. Uh, we, the turnout is just really uh, wonderful. Uh, there's a few more people than we anticipated, so we're glad that we found seats for most of you. And, and those in the back, I hope you can hear fine. And, uh, but we welcome you to Deutsch's house and welcome you to this uh, wonderful event, a roundtable discussion of Andrew Skull's Madness and Civilization. My name is Eric Banks. I'm the director of the New York Institute for the Humanities, and this is one of a number of public events we'll be presenting uh, this fall around books. Uh, we're delighted to begin in such a terrific way with such a terrific set of panelists. So I want to uh, welcome you and uh, go ahead and tell you that if you do have your cell phone turned on, you might want to check it and turn it off. Um, it's my pleasure to, to welcome Andrew Skull here tonight and, uh, and our, our great set of panelists. Um, we approach Andrew Skull's history of madness from a particular standpoint in the early 21st century. I recently heard one commentator refer to the uh, subtitle as reflecting uh, the world from Aristotle to Xanax, which I think you could not have written a few years ago. Uh, but it does give you some sense of the mere scope of his study, which is the culmination of many years spent studying the history of science, medicine, and psychology. And it's hinted at the capaciousness of this subtitle, which embraces both moments of grandeur in the history of Western civilization, with references to the Bible, to the engravings of William Hogarth, to the great system builder, uh, Sigmund Freud, and those of more uh, curiosity, if not infamy, um, over the course of the last several hundred years, including the mass incarceration of asylum architecture, the dubious claims of mesmerism, phrenology, and shock treatment. Part of what makes our own perspective on this very long history so particular are the recent developments in how we think about and deal with mental illness, including the rapid uh, deinstitutionalization in a great many countries, uh, the United States included, of what were once massive populations of patients, the meteoric rise of the pharmaceutical industry in the post-war era, the emergence of a very muscular uh, version and vision of neuroscience that threatens to further unbalance popular ideas about mental illness, and a kind of general skepticism about the very reality of mental illness. I often wondered when I looked at Professor Skull's book just how much more foreign the topic might seem to a college-age reader than it might appear to someone a mere 20 or 30 years older. Um, it is to that degree that the ground under the subject seems to have shifted over the past few decades. As Skull's book seeks to prove, the history of madness has always been staged on a sort of shifting terrain. And he states as much at the very beginning of his book. Quote, why am I writing a history of madness or mental illness? And those are all in inverted quotes. Why not call it a history of psychiatry? To such questions, I have a simple answer. That kind of history wouldn't be much of a history at all. Skull's response is not intended at all to denigrate those who would write a history of psychiatry, and I'm happy to say we have on hand tonight one of the most distinguished scholars of history of psychoanalysis. But to remind us just how deep the history of the many things that have fallen under the rubric of madness runs, it is as old as civilization itself, both described by and given form in drawing, painting, and sculpture, drama, opera, and the novel and today film and television. Uh, today, no less than, than in other periods, our ideas of sanity and mental illness are routed through the mass media imagination. If you know a tiny bit about film, film history and, and ever find yourself driving toward Long Island on the LIE and past the towering old Creedmoor Psychiatric Hospital out near the Cross, uh, Cross County Parkway, as I've done a number of times, it's impossible to see the site without immediately remembering the scene in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest uh, that uh, was uh, not filmed there, but I think a lot of people think it was filmed there, and remembering uh, McMurphy and, of course, of course Nurse Cratchit. Cratchit. Uh, I'm very happy we have such a fantastic panel to discuss Andrew Skull's book. I'll first introduce him and then introduce the other panelists. We'll have a brief uh, presentation and conversation with the panel, among the panelists, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers from you. Uh, Andrew Skull was born in Edinburgh and received his undergraduate education at Elio College, Oxford, and earned a PhD at Princeton. Subsequently, he held a postdoctoral uh, fellowship in medical history at University College London. He has held faculty positions at the University of Pennsylvania, Princeton, and at the University of California, San Diego, where he is Distinguished Professor of Sociology and Science Studies. Among others, he's held fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Shelby Cullen Davis Center for Historical Studies, and the American Council of Learned Societies. And in 1991-92, he served as president of the Society for the Social History of Medicine. He has written many books on the history of psychiatry and has published more than 100 articles in scholarly journals spanning a wide variety of disciplines. Uh, next up is George Macari. George Macari is director of the DeWitt Wallace Institute for the History of Psychiatry and professor of psychiatry at the Weill Medical Center at Cornell University. He is the author of Revolution in Mind, the Creation of Psychoanalysis, a groundbreaking history 
of the formative decades of the elaboration and institutionalization of Freudian thought. He is the author of the forthcoming Soul Machine, The Creation of the Modern Mind, a study of how writers, philosophers, physicians, and anatomists work to construct notions of the mind as not an ethereal thing, but as a natural one. Soul Machine will be published by Norton in November, so unfortunately we don't have copies for sale, but we do have copies of books by all our panelists for sale uh, after our conversation. Patrick McGrath is sitting, uh, sorry, my order is in alphabetical uh, tonight, but Patrick McGrath is on the our end here. Uh, he's one of our most celebrated novelists. Many of his novels explore the world of psychiatric illness. He's the author of eight novels, including Asylum, Martha Peak, Port Mungo, and Trauma, uh, which was shortlisted for the Costa Novel Award. His most recent novel is Constance, Bloomsbury. Uh, he's a native of London, and he probably tires of hearing this, but he grew up near Broadmoor Hospital, where his father was medical superintendent. Uh, finally, uh, next to him is Sylvia Nassar. Uh, she's the author of A Beautiful Mind, which inspired the Academy Award-winning film, and Grand Pursuit, the study, the story of uh, economic genius. She was an economics correspondent for the New York Times, and is a John S. and James L. Knight Professor of Business Journalism at Columbia University. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Vanity Fair, Newsweek, and other leading publications. So thank you all for coming, and now I turn over the mic to Andrew Skoll. Well, thank you, Eric, for that awesome introduction, and thank you all for coming to listen. I hope uh, we're going to have an invigorating discussion. I know we have some wonderful panelists who I'm delighted to be able to chat with. Um, more than four decades uh, since I began work in this field, that makes me feel very old to say, but when I did, um, meaning and madness were very tightly bound together. In the early 70s, uh, psychoanalysis was still the dominant strand in American psychiatry. And half-murdered memories were the source of people's mental troubles. And the therapy of mental illness depended heavily on the recovery of meaning. Um, within about a decade, that world had been turned upside down, and psychoanalysis was rapidly in retreat. It hasn't died, of course. but it's moved from being at the commanding heights of American psychiatry to its margins. And psychiatry from roughly, we can say, 1985, when DSM-3 appeared, has become heavily biological once more. Uh, madness, the, the, the symptoms of mental illness are seen as epiphenomenal things that are just nonsense, that are derived from the messy chemical soup in our brains uh, with a little dollop of, um, of uh, inheritance thrown in of genetics. Um, that has become the dominant view of mental illness that we've all been taught. Um, George Bush, the good, the better, uh, <laughs> proclaimed in 1991 that it was the decade of the brain. And neuroscience has certainly moved into the very center of psychiatric research. As it's done so, the meanings of madness have retreated and have been treated as, by the profession as something that can be safely ignored. I think that's a huge error. So um, I'm going to talk a, very briefly and use a few images just to sketch some of the um, vagaries of meanings and madness of, over the millennia. Um, I'm going to skate right quickly over some very complicated subjects. Um, and you'll have to forgive me for that, but I want to leave time for the broader kind of conversation. So yeah, good. Um, so right back at the beginning of um, Western civilization, we can see in uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition, a whole series of stories uh, in the Torah or the Bible uh, about madness, uh, some involving people who were potentially prophets, ambiguously saying, uh, some involving figures like the one you see here, Saul, the first king of the Jews, uh, who is ordered by Yahweh to go out and slaughter every single man, woman, child, beast belonging to the Amalekites, a tribe that uh, historically had been um, extremely troublesome to the Jews. And Saul 
who's the anointed king of the Jews, carries out those orders, but not quite entirely. He spares the king, and he spares the best animals. And in response, Samuel tells him that he's, been, he's disobeyed the Lord, and he will be punished. And he's punished by a spirit, evil spirit, coming in and dwelling in him, and causing him to behave in various mad fashion, intimately. Uh, and at the end, uh, the only tribe that uh, Saul has not conquered are the Philistines. And he fights a great battle against them, but Yahweh has deserted him. His three sons are killed. He's wounded. And here we see on the extreme left, as you're looking at it, Saul about to commit suicide. All the way through, of course, uh, into the New Testament, uh, Christianity, Christ is portrayed repeatedly as casting out devils, seven devils, for example, from Mary Magdalene. And very famously, when he goes to the country of the Gadarenes, he's confronted with a man who has gone mad, who's been chained and broken the chains, who's lived naked uh, out in the desert. And when confronted with this man, Christ, oops. Oh, kind of out. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, there he is. Christ casts out the demons into a, uh, a herd of swine who rush off and drown themselves. And uh, this is actually from the Getty. It's an Anglo-Saxon portrayal of this event. Many artists have, have looked at that. Arguably, one of the more famous episodes of this is um, Nebuchadnezzar who conquers the Jews, destroys the temple, pulls them off into exile in Babylon. None of that seems to provoke Yahweh's wrath. But when he starts boasting about his great powers, the jealous God strikes him with madness. And here he is. For seven years, he lives like a beast. His hair becomes like eagle's feathers. His uh, fingers and toes become like claws. He's reduced to the status of an animal. And then after seven years, the Lord relents. So those um, supernatural theological accounts of mental illness have a very long history. We could look at other civilizations and see this as well. Um, as Christianity spread, uh, this might be a contemporary image, you might think, but um, it's not. <laughs> uh, but it does look very like, and it actually took place in Syria, so uh, what it's worth. Uh, Christi as Christianity spread, one of the ways in which people were converted was by um, the miracles that supposedly uh, the Christian God and his devoted followers could work. Uh, very often, um, the converts attracted um, persecution and death. Um, those who died were saints as well as martyrs. This is St. Margaret of Antioch, uh, who has refused to renounce her Christianity. You can see how peaceful she looks as she goes off to heaven, the Holy Spirit there. And her violent executioner is about to take her head off. Um, <coughs> saints whose uh, saints <coughs> relics were seen to have enormous powers, curative powers, miracle working powers. Um, here's another example. This is Thomas, Thomas Beckett, the Archbishop of Canterbury, whom the king finds a thorough nuisance because he challenges royal power. The Catholic Church is a clearly a, a rival for uh, power in, in England. And Henry says, at some point, is alleged to have said at some point, who rid me of this nuisance? And these knights go off. And you can see them, this is a 13th century portrait, not long after the assassination, where he's, where Beckett is praying, not, uh, the swords are going into his head, the blood is fountain everywhere. Pilgrims came from all over to the tombs of these saints. Um, Andrew Marvell, the Elizabethan poet, said something about the grave being a fine and private place, but it, it wasn't for saints. People came and uh, worshipped 
Uh, their remains were often put into reliquaries. This is St. Foy, um, or the skull of St. Foy, actually, that was stolen by a priest from where the remains were and transported to Conk in France, where it became a, a site of pilgrimage. And of course, if we go back to Thomas Beckett, um, uh, the uh, Canterbury Tales are, of course, a tale of pilgrims en route to Canterbury to the shrine. So, deeply embedded then in various ways in, in Western history. So we've talked about sort of religious meanings of madness, but of course, and all those were clearly present in, in Greece and in, in Rome as well, uh, separately from the Christian tradition. There also emerged in that time um, a more, what proclaimed itself as a more naturalistic interpretation of mental illness alongside illness in general. This tends to be associated by most people with the figure of Hippocrates, who wasn't responsible for most of the things that were passed down to us as the writings of Hippocrates. Uh, and here, this is Rubens' um, uh, kind of rather fanciful uh, portrait of, of the man. Uh, his teachings were later systematized by Galen, uh, who was uh, uh, physician to Marcus Aurelius, another Roman emperor, somewhat to his dismay. Um, and that tradition rather died away in the West um, as, Rome, as the Roman Empire crumbled and urban civilization left. It re-entered Europe, Western Europe, in the, in the, uh, from the 11th century onwards from the Arabs. The, the Greek texts have largely survived there, and they re-entered at that time, and so from in the Middle Ages, religious and theological accounts of madness, madness is possession by the devil, or divine punishment, or the result of witchcraft, all of those things were current, but as well, some of these conditions were seen as perhaps rooted in the body. Uh, and physicians uh, and divines debated about where that boundary lay, but both conceded that some belonged in the territory of each. Um, this is um, Bruegel's painting of Cutting for Stone. Uh, a physician is, this is something that depends on folk beliefs that somehow there was a stone of madness that you could remove and thereby remove the madness. But I suggest there's a kind of satirical edge to this painting. If you notice, the physician who's taking a scalpel to this guy's um, scalp, is wearing what looks remarkably like a dunce's cap. So I suspect many people were a bit skeptical of mad doctoring even back then. Um, through the centuries that followed, and particularly by the time we move into the 17th and 18th centuries, Medical explanations of madness are becoming more and more of the dominant ones. Not that the other ideas completely die away, they haven't completely died away even today, but certainly medicine comes to the fore. We get as well the beginnings of an institutional provision for the mentally ill. In, in England, this takes the form of something called a trade in lunacy, the opening of profit making madhouses run by mad doctors who uh, care for the patients. And by the end of the 18th century, we see a variety of bits of technology being introduced as forms of treatment. This particular uh, thing shows a swinging chair. It was suggested by Erasmus Darwin, Charles' grandfather, and implemented in various ways. And the poor patient was put in that thing and then revolved it fierce rate, so that they vomited, they voided their bowels and their bladders, they lost consciousness, and they were supposedly frightened back into their wits. Um, I'm going to be talking in Belgium at the asylum where this gentleman who devised this technique uh, once presided in the early 19th century. This is called a Chinese temple. It sort of looks like an elevator shaft uh, over a bridge. It, the top image is the one you want to look at. That's the lunatic who's being locked up in the iron cage and is being lowered below the water to simulate drowning. A sort of 19th century waterboarding. And finally, an American invention. It looks a bit like the electric chair, but it wasn't. It's too early. 
Um, this is the first use of the word tranquilizer in psychiatry. This was invented by Benjamin Rush. He kept the body completely still. It stopped the blood rushing about, particularly to the head. You could pour cold water on the top. Um, and you could apply heat to the bottom to draw the stuff away from the overheated brain. And you shut out all sensation. So that's the tranquilizer. Um, Eric mentioned in his introduction um, the rise of things like mesmerism and phrenology. Um, just very briefly, uh, in, in the 17th century, uh, a, uh, an Oxford physician named Willis had begun the first serious anatom uh, anatomy of the brain. And it was Willis who coined, coined the term neurology. Uh, by uh, the late 18th, early 19th century, the um, morbid anatomy was increasingly central to medicine. And two Viennese physicians, uh, Franz Grohl and uh, Johann Spurzheim, developed the doctrine of phonology, which saw the brain as a conjury of organs um, that in, in each location was a different psychological dimension of the human character. And the brain could be developed by exercise, like muscles, or if you didn't use it, it atrophied. And the relative proportions of the different faculties showed themselves on the outside of the head because the skull conformed to the underlying shape of the brain. And so here we have um, uh, Gaul actually examining a, a young lady with various guys waiting in line with very strange pumps on their heads to be, have their characters analyzed. It was also an explanation of why, of course, you went insane with this, that you had underdeveloped COVID. The 19th century is really the age of the asylum. In that era, that all across Western Europe and North America, we see the development of the mass incarceration of the insane, and along with that, the emergence of something that by the end of the 19th century, we in the English-speaking world called psychiatry, originally a German term, but one that was rejected. So uh, this is actually from the French alienist uh, uh, Escarol's book uh, from 1837. And you can see that the early mad doctors continued to rely on restraint. And that um, particular personage looks as though she might need some restraint, too. Um, Later on, they began to abandon that notion, and they said moral suasion alone could control these patients. This is the first English textbook on insanity, the first serious one by Mark Miller too. What's interesting here is, after phrenology being discredited, there was still the notion that you might read the increasingly elaborate different types of insanity that alienists were identifying on the countenance of the mad patient. So these various patients are meant to exemplify different forms of insanity. Um, the asylum had been founded in a fit of extraordinary utopian optimism. These places were going to be curative instruments, and the moral architecture that made them up was a vital part of the cure. But unfortunately, in reality, the asylum couldn't live up to those glorious expectations. The claims, for example, American psychiatrists or alienists made in the 1830s and 40s, that they could cure 60, 70, 80, even 90 percent of their patients and of their rights. Instead, the asylums increasingly got clogged with patients. They got more and more massive. Eric was referring to one of them in the introduction, but Milledgeville in Georgia, for example, in uh, the early 20th century, had nearly 14,000 inhabitants. It was a town. And uh, as they didn't cure, so a much more pessimistic discourse emerged, and the asylum's image deteriorated very badly. The upshot was people who had money tried to avoid it. And one of the places in America where they avoided it was located in Battle Creek, Michigan. Um, the, the sanitarium then there had been founded by the Seventh-day Adventists. It was taken over by two gentlemen who made a fortune from their dietary peculiarities and the, the things they invented then, called the Kellogg's. Um, and at Battle Creek, you, there were a variety of treatments, many involving static electricity. You see some, uh, some uh, sometimes uh, sporadic electricity, so the vibrator is very rather decorous, kind of 
something. Uh, you had a phototherapy. You had enormous attention to the bowels and to diet, uh, a sort of pre-gluten um, kind of um, bad. If we move back across the Atlantic uh, to Paris, uh, there, were, there, were, there, there was a rather different patient population, not the rich patients, the presidents and the Hollywood actors and the titans of industry who showed up uh, to, to get the administrations of Kellogg's, but uh, all the poor people who were thrust into the Salpetriere, uh, an enormous museum of all kinds of pathology. This gentleman here, who called himself, and you can see him adopting the pose, the Napoleon of the neuroses, is none other than Jean-Martin Charcot, the most famous neurologist of the last part of the 19th century. Uh, Charcot had built his reputation on identifying a host of horrible neurological disorders, which persist to this day and remain largely incurable and extremely sad. Multiple sclerosis, ALS, or what we tend to call Lou Gehrig's disease, a whole host of these things. But in the 1880s, he turned his attention to what became the illness of the age, hysteria. And he developed this working on his poor patients and then made his money working on rich. And he would lecture like this, much better than I, because you're a much more dramatic figure, every Tuesday and Friday in Paris, and he would bring in patients to demonstrate, and they were almost always female patients, almost always clad in, well, the scantily, shall we say, and as they were hypnotized by him, they behaved in unmistakably erotic ways, and this was a mixed audience, anybody could come, not just physicians, um, and so these became quite the attraction, I think you can see something of what I mean here. What year is this? Uh, this would have been in the 1880s and into the 1890s. Freud actually went to uh, Paris to study under Charcot. It was the last throw of the dice before he had to throw up his European career and move to America, a place he saw as a land of savages. Uh, when he did come here, he said the country should be renamed Valeria, as it worshipped the Bible. Uh, and in fact, you can't see it at the bottom, but this particular image was actually given by Charcot to Freud, and it's inscribed at the bottom. You can see that if you look in the book. So anyway, that, um, we get a lot of that sort of thing going on. Um, obviously, I'm moving extraordinarily rapidly here through history, but just to give you a little, little bit. So I'm not going to talk about Freud, but of course, Freud took back to Vienna um, Charcot's emphasis on, on Hypnosis, uh, his work with Breuer, which appears in studies in hysteria, centered around that subject. Um, and originally, Freud used um, the same techniques he learned in Paris. He wasn't very good at uh, hypnosis, actually. And eventually, he abandoned it and, of course, developed an alternative therapy, which was quite, quite different. But again, revolved very much about the, around the issues of meaning. Now, in the, as we move to the 21st century, we leap across for the second half of the 20th to begin with, we move um, to a period where psychiatry advances into modernity. Let's not completely forget uh, that in the teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s, psychiatry experimented with a whole host of things which now strike us as quite barbaric. Um, giving people malaria deliberately to cure maybe their tertiary syphilis or general paralysis or the insane, uh, eviscerating them, pulling out their teeth and their tonsils, and then moving down to eliminate focal sepsis that was uh, allegedly poisoning their brains. You don't have antibiotics, so you practice surgical bacteriology. Uh, giving them insulin to put them in a coma repeatedly, um, giving them other things to stimulate seizures, eventually replaced by ECT, the only one of these treatments that survives into the present. And finally, of course, lobotomy, which wins a Nobel Prize in 1949. But not long after that, we get the first of the modern miracles. Medical identity now revolves around prescribing magic bullets. <laughs> 
inventory ones. Penicillin and the antibiotics are among the first of these. So medical identity becomes increasingly wrapped up in prescribing these kinds of substances. And psychiatry gets one of its own in 1954, Thorazine, as it's known on this side of the Atlantic, or Largactyl on the other side of the Atlantic, which meant mighty drug, because it treated so many things. Well, one of the things, as you can see from this, this is a real ad from the 50s, um, it's good for wife beating. <laughs> Or in the alternative, if you've got a grouchy granddad <laughs> feeding Thorazine, he'll be zoned out. Shortly thereafter, we get um, Milltown and later Valium, the so-called minor tranquilizers that spread everywhere. I'm a child of the 60s, so I remember when this song, when the song came out. Whoops, nope, coming ahead. That was a lovely Rolling Stones song about mother's little helper. It helps her on her way to her busy, dying day. What a drag it is to get old. Well, it's a drag to be a housewife. This is a real ad, too. And look at what it, it proclaims. You can't set her free. I mean, she's got to do the housework. By God, you know, that's what we're for. Uh, but we can give her a pill and then she'll stop being miserable out there. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to end. We then move, of course, into the age of Prozac and better than well. Just take a tablet, all your troubles will melt away. Um, at a certain price, because it turns out these psychiatric drugs are anything but penicillin. They don't cure, they treat symptoms, and they often carry a very heavy price. This is a spoof image I would rather love by a Canadian who calls himself a natural epileptic. He won't take medication for his epilepsy. He's very anti-medicine. I'm not endorsing that view. But um, he wanted to spoof um, <coughs> antidepressants and to talk seriously in the course of the spoof about their effects, about some of these negative effects I'm talking about. So here we have that image. And as you see at the top, no sex, please, because we're on antidepressants. And what are the, the side effects of antidepressants? They're down at the bottom. Um, you'll, you'll become interested, no longer interested in sex. You'll be zoned, zonked out and have no more feelings left. And um, the little lyrics at the bottom here are a modified version of um, the song The White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane. Um, which is a uh, suitably psychedelic kind of song about the modifications of consciousness of the, the mushroom. Well, when you, when you take these pills, is what's going to happen to you. So I think it's a rather lovely demonstration of the fact that meanings and madness still coincide even now. So I'm going to stop there um, because I, I hope we're going to have a, yeah. a little conversation among ourselves. So thank you. stand back here just to go perspective on this and probably would like to begin with uh, with George Macari because of course the second half of your your talk certainly touches on subjects that he's written extensively about so uh, George I wonder the comments you might have and we'll use this as a way to kind of work our way around and have a conversation about the book. Okay sounds good. Um, before I start, I want to confess I had a symptom on the way here <laughs> and it might be relevant. I was in the subway and I saw a young woman reading a book, and I thought for sure she was reading the book upside down. And I thought, well, that's very strange. What does that mean? And I thought, oh no, perhaps I'm going to be misinterpreting Andrew completely. So if everything is upside down, please excuse me. Uh, this is an extraordinary work. It is a work of 40 years of scholarship. Uh, it is a short book for the title and for the ambition. And it's done exceedingly well. Uh, the capacity to synthesize and bring together such a wide range of sources is really daunting, it's impressive, and it's well needed because we don't have good histories of psychiatry. So um, thank you, Andrew, for that. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, let me uh, ask a couple of questions. I really want to focus on that 
issue. How do you frame such a book? What do you keep in and what do you exclude? Um, because I think that may be, um, it's interesting to me at least, um, the title of Andrew's book says a lot. Uh, Madness in Civilization. And that's of course intended, I'm sure, to resonate with Michel Foucault's the English translation of madness and civilization. Now, as some of you may know, Foucault defined madness and civilization in opposition. They were dialectically opposed. Civilization in the age of reason defined a medical kind of madness, unreason, as its boundary, its exterior. So the two were completely in dialectical relationship, one defined the other. Civilization was the absence of madness. Madness was the absence of civilization. Now, Andrew, in his introduction, states very clearly that he rejects that model, and his model is madness in civilization. So I want to press him a little bit to find out more about what he means by that. He goes to great lengths to define madness, and in the introduction, does so, I think, exceedingly well. But I wanted to ask him, what's civilization? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, if I could recur for a minute, obviously the title indeed does refer back to Foucault's book, at least as it appeared in English. And for many years, I, I wondered where that title came from. I asked some of Foucault's followers who were legion, you know, if they knew, nobody knew. Um, had Foucault come up with it? Because it's not the French original at all. Completely new. And finally, when I was writing this book, I thought, damn it, um, there must be a way to find this out. And it turns out that Richard Howard, who'd done the translation, was, was, and I hope still is, alive and a professor of poetry at Columbia. And I got in touch with him and I said, uh, Professor Howard, did, did you come up with the title? Did Foucault come up with the title? And he wrote back and said, no, it was a marketing person at Pantheon. <laughs> <laughs> So Foucault didn't set out to write a book on madness and civilization. I do think because that title is so resonant, it, it, did, it, did, it was a terrific marketing idea. Uh, the notion of the relationship between the two is um, obviously central, and it, implicitly it was central to his discussion. But whereas he ranges at best from the Middle Ages to the end of the 18th century, uh, my ranges more widely. So when, when I look at civilization, I suppose I should say civilizations, uh, and although I treat at much less length uh, the place of madness elsewhere, I do talk about, for example, Islam and madness, and about the place of madness in China, in the imperial China, and the ways in which it was seen, responded to, and to some degree then, what has happened over the years, as the West acquired its um, dominance over the world, and via um, imperialism spread its psychiatry. And in the present, of course, um, it's really uh, it's um, the, the uh, pharmacological industry that has spread those particular notions most most widely. They acted as I can misquote Marx as sort of battering rams that smashed down the Chinese walls and let Western psychiatry into all kinds of settings. Um, so civilization is a word with many different meanings. One of the things I wanted to insist on is madness is very real. Uh, we don't understand it very well, even now. Uh, the metaphysical wager that medicine has placed that it's all rooted in the body is one that hasn't paid off very much yet. Not, not that it hasn't paid off at all, but it's, it's you know, what we have are a set of band-aids, not a real set of cures. Um, and so uh, the, the in rather than the end was meant to say, look, this is something in, in, in our midst. It's something that's part of all of us. If we don't suffer from these things ourselves, our nearest and dearest or close friends of ours undoubtedly do. Uh, Madness has fascinated artists, it's fascinated writers, it's fascinated people from all walks of life. And um, we have to see that presence of unreason in the midst of reason rather than assuming the two things are 
one of the things I think that the move to a biological psychiatry has done in the last few years is it wrecked this notion, of, once again, of here are the mad and here are the same, whereas whatever quarrels I have with psychoanalysis, and they are many, as George well knows, um, the, the reality was Freud treated madness and sanity as a continuum. And I think that's a much more realistic point of view than the notion that the matter over here and the rest of us is somewhere else. Pass the, pass the mic to uh, Sophia. Well, Andy, I, I want to ask, I, I think this is an extraordinary uh, work of scholarship. It's going to be around for 100 years, and it's going to be the standard. Um, but I want to know, why are you so pessimistic? Why are you, you know, the history that you cite is, like all human history, horrendous and full of cruelty and and ignorance and, and error, including well-intentioned <coughs> error um, by people who, um, who cared enough to want to help, but actually made things worse. Um, you, you say, well, um, there's, no, there's no silver bullet, there's no penicillin. But there's no penicillin for most serious chronic <laughs> illnesses. And you know, Richard Nixon um, declared a war, the war on cancer decades and decades ago. Um, it seems to me that um, that if if we ask people who suffer from schizophrenia and and their families, if we ask them in what era of history would you like, you know, if you had a choice. Where would you like to be dropped? You know, I think you know, 99.9% would say right here, right now, because it was. It's not that it's so great now, but actually, um, a significant minority of young people who are being diagnosed with this devastating illness now can have a life that was never true before. They can. They can have careers, they can have homes, they can uh, have families. Um, so I think that, um, I guess, you know, reading this you know, often tragic history makes me appreciate more how, how far we've come in a very, very short period of time, in just a couple of decades. And I would say that, yes, um, uh, we've all been to presentations by geneticists and by neuroscientists that promise, um, you know, that promise the earth. But, and you know, I'm sure that things are not going to happen that fast. But it is true that this is the first time that that medicine and science, scientific research, and particularly in the area of psychiatry have actually been integrated. I mean, so, so my question is, in a long-winded way, why, are, why have you ended on such a seemingly pessimistic note? That's a very, very good question. Hollywood say, would say, where's the third act? Where's the nice, happy ending? <laughs> I wish there were a happy ending. And you're absolutely right that um, for some people, the um, drug revolution that I spoke of has proved a boom. I think when we look at, at mental patients, what, what we have to see is that, uh, as Milton Freeman is alleged to have said, but he wasn't the first to say it, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, and we need to remember that, not just with psychiatric medication, with all forms of medication. They come at a price. Uh, the question is the balance of, of um, benefit and, and disadvantage. Um, and I see psychiatric patients, as I look at the literature, as falling into three groups. A group of people for whom these drugs are unambiguously beneficial. 
the, the, the benefits they receive from these drugs far outweigh any side effects they get. And you're quite right, for some schizophrenics, for some people suffering from manic depressive illness, these chemical weapons have been somewhat effective. They, they are never wholly without their side effects. There's a group in the middle where the balance of, of advantage and disadvantage is, is much more narrowly poised. And then there are a group of people who are non-responsive, and they're a large fraction of the people we're talking about. So uh, I think uh, there, the, the disadvantages that come with the drugs, the side effects, are not very good. I think the other thing that troubles me about the, one of the things that history shows is the swings of the pendulum. It's not a portrait of either uninterrupted progress or benighted state of affairs at all times. Uh, the early asylums, for example, I think the, the evidence is fairly, fairly, fairly good, did a lot of good and did manage, I think, some of the patients' retrospective diagnosis being very, very difficult. But some of those patients undoubtedly were schizophrenic and they probably benefited from what was largely something we call psychosocial therapy, but that proved very hard to create in a kind of routine kind of basis. So one of the things that troubles me about the swing back to biology at the moment is we're putting all our eggs in that basket. And I think madness is, in fact, very multifaceted. The social and the psychological have to be taken account of alongside whatever physical causes may also exist. So my sense of things is, and it's a guess, it's a hypothesis, because um, we don't know. I think it's highly unlikely that the very serious forms of alienation aren't going to have some strong biological component. I don't think that's going to be the whole of the story. So, so I, I would like to see a more balanced kind of approach. But you know, it's it's all very well to say we're in such a better world right now. But uh, Eric referred to deinstitutionalization at the beginning. If you walk around the streets of New York or San Francisco or San Diego, you tumble up with the victims of deinstitutionalization. The biggest place of psychiatric care in my state is the Los Angeles County Jail. And if we look at the life expectancy of the mentally ill, it's 20 to 25 years less than the rest of us. So it's hard in the face of that to think, you know, and yes, there's been, I'm not somebody who says there's been no progress, nor am I a lot about these drugs. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a Scientologist, I'm not one of those people who talks about toxic psychiatry. Psychiatry is the best, the best we've got, which is staying very wonderful. I wish it were better. I think you mentioned that the population group states uh, that, the, that the life expectancy has declined. declined. Yes, and it's declined for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, Andy, the first time I came in, in contact with your work was when I was sent uh, a copy of Masters of Bedlam. Mm. LA Times to review, um, and uh, I responded with great joy to this. Um, uh, first of all, because psychiatry is, is a, a, an abiding interest. I'm a novelist. I'm not a, a, any kind of specialist. But um, I could claim that my father was the master of bed. Mm. Uh, in fact, I might even claim he was the last master of bed. Um, given that he ran a large maximum security psychiatric hospital in the south of England called Broadmoor, which would give the same frisson to uh, an English listener as Creedmoor does, I think, to an American um, listener. And so as I embarked upon Masters of Bedlam, it um, uh, was a wonderful story that uh, was, was unfolded. Um, I had assumed of psychiatry that it was the profession of my father. He was a founder member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, um, and that's as good as it gets, really, for a profession to have a, a, a royal society. Um, and I suppose it had never really occurred to me that psychiatry had a beginning and a middle, had an infancy and an adolescence, and that back in, in the first days, um, these were, as I think you briefly mentioned, um, the folks who serviced the upper classes. Um, 
who were embarrassed by the presence in their families of a member who'd uh, become bonkers. And so um, this, uh, this need was met um, by these characters, many of whom were charlatans, and were you know, looking for to, to, to make a buck. And then um, over the years, the psychiatrist becomes uh, far more respectable, um, uh, uh, member of the medical profession, until finally he has a, a, a royal society. Um, I suppose what I wanted to say to you was that in, in all the work that you've done, I found this tremendous sort of narrative sweep. And as a fellow writer, uh, I enjoy the way you tell a story. Uh, and the sort of characters that you have brought uh, to our attention as one, as a man close to the end of the uh, Masters of Bedlam, um, Henry Maudsley, who would be very familiar to, to, to uh, some of us, many of us, I hope. Uh, a man who was a star when he was uh, in his young manhood in the mid-19th century, uh, a great clinician, he dominated the field as it then was, and then grows more deeply pessimistic as the years go by uh, and as the ideas of degeneracy begin more and more to um, uh, seize late 19th century thinkers, so does uh, Henry Maudsley turn into a sort of an old testament figure with a great white beard, uh, who's saying there is no hope. Um, uh, uh, the mad will always be mad. I don't know if he ever actually said words the equivalent to sort of exterminate the brutes, but there is something Mr. Kurtz about Henry Maudsley. So I suppose my, my point is that the characters as vivid as Henry Maudsley, and I'd like, love to talk about Henry Cotton, but I should probably shut up. But, uh, and the stories that you tell uh, are, 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 are brilliant, uh, and your ear for a good story, your ability to tell it. Is, is fantastic. So I'm just giving a bland, blanket recommendation to all your works, particularly your, your magnum opus. Could I ask one question? You, you mentioned the early days of the asylum, and Broadwood was built in response to the need to replace the old bedroom of filth and degradation with something that was full of uh, daylight uh, uh, and, uh, and fresh air and kindness. Um, and it seemed, and it still seems, like a very good idea. If you could give the mentally ill a sign in the sense that they are protected from the stresses of, of life that only exacerbate the illness um, and uh, sustain uh, an atmosphere of, of kindliness from the staff, uh, the moral treatment, as it was called, is that as good as it gets in terms of methods of dealing with madness over the years? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, in some ways, I think uh, my answer would be yes, but I, I point to how difficult that situation is when it comes to sustainability. Uh -huh. um, over and over again, as you look at this history, there are charismatic figures who intervene, who are extremely well-meaning, and often for a time quite effectual, um, and manage to produce institutions where, indeed, the, 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 the notion of a retreat or an asylum, uh, as they were called, those weren't bad words at the beginning. Those were words that were meant to talk about removing people from a world that they couldn't cope with, and they found too harsh, and providing them kindly and hopefully therapeutic environment for them. The difficulty in part is that the mad aren't always grateful in the face of these things. Mm -hmm. um, many of them were poor. It's hard to, uh, if you can't provide cure, to encourage society to provide the kinds of resources, to provide the kinds of salaries for the therapists and the, the keepers. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard once institutions reach a certain size to preserve any sense of individuality in the midst of all of those things. And the tendency is to shift towards bureaucratic routine. Um, it's perfectly true that the old asylums did provide clothing, shelter, meals. And if you look at the homeless these days, it's clear we as a society failed to do that. Mm -hmm. And we 
it, it's ironic that asylums were set up by people who were horrified at the presence of the mentally ill in jails and prisons. And yet, if we look today, that's where very many of the seriously mentally ill end up in a kind of revolving door between the gutter and the prison, and maybe a board and care home and, or a welfare hotel, and then back into the cycle all over again. Um, one of the things I think makes it very difficult here is that when you isolate people, as asylums did, um, and you declare that people within them aren't moral agents anymore because of their madness, uh, it becomes easy to victimize them. It becomes hard to check against violence, which was very much part of the asylum scene. And uh, I think overall, it, uh, it's just a, a very hard, maybe not impossible, but hard mm -hmm. thing to sustain. And the temptation, because you want to cure, you want to do more than just uh, provide shelter, provide a kind of boarding home, uh, is to intervene. And the various rather graphic experiments that I talked about are, I think, symptomatic of both the vulnerability of the mentally ill and the desperation not of their families and of their physicians to find something that we can do. Uh, to, you know, if you think of lobotomy, I have a couple of really shocking images I didn't show tonight, partly because we're going to go and have dinner later, I hope, and, and it's rather hard to stomach. But one is of a woman being dragged off naked to be lobotomized against her will. And it's not an expose. It was printed in the major textbook on lobotomy as sometimes we have to lobotomize them against because they're mad and they don't know what's in their own interest in locking their frontal lobes. And the second one is an image of Walter Freeman actually doing uh, a, a um, transorbital lobotomy where he stuck an ice pick through people's eye socket into the brain. Um, you know, that sort of thing, unfortunately, if you look at the history of the asylum, comes up again and again. So I, I would love to think, you know, first, I don't think politically it's going to happen because of the cost. I think some sort of sheltered care for some of these people would be an excellent idea. Could we avoid the history that we've seen? Perhaps, but it would be hard. Um, could I just uh, follow up and say, you, you mentioned that the mentally ill are not moral agents once institutionalized. Um, it's also the case that they're not political agents. And so as a constituency, they really don't have a voice, possibly alone among all members of society. Not just that, Patrick, but if you think about it, because one of the one of the things when I talk about why do I talk about madness rather than mental illness, because it's it's a stigmatizing word. It's a word we recoil from. It's sort of like the N-word or you know, some of the slurs that are directed against homosexual. Um, so why madness? Actually I want to emphasize stigma because I think it's such a recurrent feature of the of the illness. And as a result, not just are the patients disabled, but their families very frequently are shamed into not taking action. Um, and so uh, I see over and over again, in my own state of California, for example, when it comes time to cut the budget, the mentally ill are at the top of the list, because they're not, they're, they're not a politically powerful um, constituency. Can I ask a follow-up question? So, it seems to me, though, that one can't be against the asylum and against homelessness. In other words, there are troubles on all sides. And you have to, in some way, if you are put in a position to act, you have to make very difficult choices. And um, I think one of the things, when we talk about Foucault, one of the um, great stains on Foucauldians is that they help legitimize a mass deinstitutionalization of patients some of which was it was appropriate, absolutely, but which um, conspired with fiscal conservatives to leave us with a massive homeless population, much of which, or at least some portion of which, have been reinstitutionalized in the prisons. So you can be for liberation, but if you take care of the people afterwards, and and it's been a problem. I would say that you know the great value of, of Andrew's work, and, and uh, to be clear, I am both a working psychiatrist and a historian, uh, so I try to negotiate these kinds of problems uh, as best as I can. 
is as a moral and a cautionary tale. And the, the, the great, I think, um, central uh, villain in this story is no individual, but it is scientism, it, it, at least in the modern era. It is the hyping up of real empirical stuff to, to an ideological purpose that then leads to all sorts of destructive um, outcomes. And that for psychiatrists, much of the work involves tolerating ambiguity and uncertainty and doing the best you can with underdetermined situ uh, facts and situations. And so when you read about someone who followed germ theory, which was a, is the theory for penicillin, and followed it logically down the path to extracting everybody's teeth in his asylum, the interest in the story isn't just in the gruesomeness of it. The interest is in the logic of it. The interest is in the way a person could be lulled into following a stream of thoughts, some of which had empirical validation, to go far beyond that and do something terrible. So that's how I think of it. And I, I, I have to say, I agree with Sylvia. I wouldn't want someone who is in desperate need for psychiatric care to read your book. Anyone else, I think, should read your book. But they will not be in the place to understand that there are certain things that can be done, and there is certain hope that should be offered. Um, I can only say amen to that. Um, I don't, you know, it, one of the things I hope the book doesn't come across as is an anti-psychiatry diatribe. Um, it, I recognize fully the misery and the uh, trauma and the problems that mental illness causes, not just for the mentally ill themselves, but for everybody around them. Uh, and I think, for the most part, the psychiatrists are well-intentioned. Good intentions aren't always enough. And, and the risk, as George has just rightly pointed out, is that you can become seized by a sense of your own uh, breakthrough, and as a result, be led to do things that are in retrospect, utterly terrible. Henry Cotton, who eviscerated the patients and pulled their teeth, is one example. Walter Freeman, who was desperate to re remove people from the backwards of asylums and promoted lobotomy, going around the country in his lobotomobile, demonstrating his <laughs> technique with his kids in the back, uh, is another one of these true believers. And one of, the, I think, I hope one of the messages of the book is not is not pessimism, but but. Uh, a real caution, a real sense that we recognize the limits of our knowledge and the uncertainty <coughs> that George referred to, the, the need to have a proper humility in approaching something that has defeated so many brilliant minds, or if not defeated them, has left us with only very partial success. And, uh, so, you know, one of the things that happened a couple of years ago is psychiatry produced its latest iteration of its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, DSM-5. And the very week that it came out, the um, director of NIMH, Tom, Tom Insull, gave an interview in which he said, this is a scientific monstrosity. We're not going to use it in NIMH. We're not going to use it to guide research. There's no such thing as schizophrenia. There's no such thing as manic depressive illness. And I thought, the Scientologist is going to make a meal of that. And I, I understand what he was trying to say. I know what his intent is, but boy, that was politically a very stupid set of comments, if I might say so. He just took a job at Google. Really? Uh -huh. Drop what? Uh -huh. He just took a job at Google. He left the NIH. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have time for, I think, two quick questions. So uh, I see three hands and five people. Uh, can I start with you? And I'm going to just walk to the mic. Uh, walk with you bring the mic, and then I think you, you had your hand up. Um, thanks for your talk. I, I, uh, my question is about, I guess, on the one hand, the fetishization of mental illness, and you can, I guess, invoke like schizoanalysis or whatever people talk about. But the history that I'm specifically interested in is is Felix Guattari's work with, uh, and I think. The guy's name slips my mind. He was a he. He had some institutions during the Spanish Civil War, and Felix Guattari went to work with this guy, and they, they did. And this was what Guattari Guattari was inspired to 
do this work where like the 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 patients would pull down the walls of institutions. But then what one of the I think one of the one of the things that I was interested in in terms of the follow of this this um, like schizoanalytic Quartarian term is is uh, actually Franz Fanon, right? Starting as a like, uh, like, a, like a, someone interested in mentally ill people and and having critical race theory and anti-colonial theory really come out of that. And I'm wondering if you if you look into those those roots and do do that kind of connection. Okay, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and hand you the mic if you want to give us your question as well. We can answer the one. Um, so you talk about stigma, and I'm very interested in the narratives um, you're sharing with us, but I'm also very interested personally in my own research in the way mental illness, as Western psychiatry defines it, um, can be a transformative experience for people, and I'm looking at narratives throughout history that show it as that, and I'm interested in what sorts of things you came across in your research of that. Most guitar, it might be a little bit outside the scope, but I'll let you Yeah, um, yeah I don't have any particularly insightful comments on most of guitar. I once was at a conference here in New York, and I find it incomprehensible. Um, <laughs> but I, I do talk a little bit about Fanon in the context of talking about psychiatry and imperialism. But um, let me respond to this question over here, because I think it is a, a, an important one. Um, I spoke at the Smithsonian a couple of nights ago, and somebody said to me, well, why hasn't mental illness died out? Why hasn't um, the operation of natural selection caused this all to disappear? And um, one form of answer to that is that mental illness often seems to be connected to creativity. That the notion of madness and genius being near allied is, of course, an old one going all the way back to Aristotle. Uh, and there does seem to be, particularly, for example, with manic depressive illness, we can all point to uh, writers and artists for whom this seems to be um, very much part of their creativity. I, I talk about Ernest Hemingway, for example, in the book, who uh, undergoes a series of uh, ECTs for his depression, and, uh, decides they've ruined, you know, they, they cure the patient and they've ruined his talent and blows his, blows his head off with a shotgun. Uh, so I think uh, this is part of the biological diversity of the human condition. And it's also the case that madness has often been seen uh, across different civilizations as being a positive as well as a negative thing. So if you look back when I tell the story right at the beginning of Saul and David, lurking in the background is Samuel. If you read Samuel's behavior, the fact that he's hearing voices from God and he'd be locked up at various times in history. And um, the Old Testament prophets, it was not always clear whether they were, were mad or God's messengers, even to the people at the time. Um, and the notion of the holy fool, I mean, there's a long tradition within Christianity of seeing the positive in madness. And, uh, right down into the late 20th century, Ronald Lang, for example, made a career out of proclaiming that schizophrenia was super sanity. We all needed to have a schizophrenic episode, which I really? seriously doubt myself. But there we are. So you know, there, there very much is that strand through the story, through the story, and it's something we we need to pay attention to. And I think, um, as I say, that it's not something we can simply exterminate. One of the terrible things Patrick talked about. Henry Maudsley, who becomes completely misanthropic and says if we'd only let the laws of natural selection exist, uh, these mentally ill would exterminate themselves. They, they can't provide for themselves, so they just die. And of course, that's what provokes sterilization laws. My state, California, did half of all the involuntary sterilization that existed here. And its law was the model for the Nazi law in the early 1930s. And then the Nazis, lacking the kinds of restraints that come from religious traditions and from uh, living in a democratic culture, took that argument to its logical extreme. If the insane were useless eaters, if they weren't going to recover, by God, we should kill them all. And they were the ones who first 
were gassed and burned. And that technology, those machines, those technicians were then exported east to the death camps. It was a terrible business. Well, I'm such a Horrible note to end on, but uh, <laughs> yes, it really is. I'm sorry. Here we are. <laughs> so, uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank all our panelists. Uh, we offer book sales at the back, so I hope you'll take advantage of that and pick up a copy. And uh, please uh, give a round of applause for us.